All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, so just before we jump into lectures, uh, I had a couple of questions about the assignment. So at least some people are looking into it and thinking about it, which is good. Uh, I had a question, what format? So I say in there five pages. Um, I, I'm thinking like five, not two sides, so not ten sides, but five sides. I'm trying to limit the amount of work you guys have to do and limit the amount of marking I have to do. Uh, but I had a question about what format. Does it need to be like double column or anything like these conference papers? No, preferably not. Preferably just open up Word and start typing. Um, this isn't, you shouldn't think of this as a conference publication or anything like this. This is a, a report on your brainstorming activities. So there's no fixed format. There's no um, requirements in that respect. It's just, it's, it's basically for you guys to describe what you got out of the exercise, what you did, what you learned, what you would do differently next time. Um, yeah, so don't, don't, certainly don't think there's any requirements about I have to have this in size 10 or 10 point Times New Roman and, and two columns and just whatever is fine. Um, as long as it's reasonable, don't make like 72 point font so you're gonna get three words on a page. Um, and don't, likewise, don't do 0 0.6 font so you can write like 100,000 words because I'm trying to make it easier on you guys and me. Um, the other question we had was about referencing. So if you are reading a paper, uh, you know, you're doing a bit of background research, that is one thing that I would say, you know, might be worth having a references section at the end of your document. And then in your thing you can say um, the work of, you know, uh, Bob et al. and then number one, and then in the references you have number one in the paper that you reference it from. I'm, at, for the assignment, I'm not planning on going through and checking your references and stuff like that, but it, keeping references is, while this isn't an academic paper, it is a good habit to keep those references because I can guarantee you, you won't remember them later on. You'll, if you're like, oh, I read that really good paper and it talked about all the stuff and you don't actually write down what the paper was or anything, chances are you won't remember. Uh, it's a good habit to get into it. I'm sure Rob will probably address this at some point in time if Sung Chul or um, Anthony isn't, to uh, make sure, or to when you're reading a paper, if it is something which you think is interesting and relevant, I would often, if there's a, some blank white space on the front or the back of the paper, if you're printing it out, to actually write down, uh, you know, this paper was interesting because blah, blah. So but when I finished my PhD, I had a, like a stack of papers that thick and each one of them I'd written, found some white space and just written in it. Um, you know, this paper had a really good experiment on uh, XYZ or the results in this paper show that perhaps this isn't a good approach to go. Like a one, two sentence is just sort of, so you can pick it up, just read your brief summary in your own words and go, oh yeah, that's right, this was the paper that had that. There are lots of various tools for doing that um, as well, like uh, EndNote and BibTech and all those sorts of things will often allow you to provide a summary for paper, but I'm fairly old school in that I like to read my paper as paper because it's just easier than reading it on a screen. So in which case, you know, keep a file somewhere. I don't know, do you guys desks have like filing cabinets or anything? Or a space you can keep something on? No, okay, keep a file somewhere, you know, even if it's just like ask, um, Mel for a manila folder or something, you just put your, your papers in so that you've, you've still got them with your notes attached to them if you're, you're like that um, and like to keep things on paper. Okay, uh, any other more questions about um, the assignment today? No? Okay, everyone's looking a, a little bit sort of stunned. Uh, which I'm taking to mean that not uh, so many people have started it yet, but that's fine, you've still got time. Uh, what did I do? I literally just downloaded all the things which are submitted. Oh, there they are. Okay, so three out of six of you actually did the homework, which is good. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Um, no, that's okay. It, you don't have to do the assignments, they're not marked, oh, the homework, sorry, they're not marked or anything. Uh, it's more just to encourage you guys to, you know, open up processing and do some stuff. Is, before, before I open this, is everyone happy for me to open their assignments in front of everyone, or the three of you who did something? Um, so we'll have a look, starting here. Do you wanna talk about, should we just run it and see what we did, yeah. see what we got? Yeah. yeah? 
Okay, so, ooh, ooh, very pretty. Okay, so tell us what, uh, what's going on here. <laughs> Yep. Do you remember what you changed? Um, so uh, the size, the color, the, um, um, the, the number of particles. Mm -hmm. mm, that, that's it, I think. That's all right. And I mean, did you, we, did you find it fairly easy to change those things to figure out, like, if I change this, this thing yeah, changed? Yeah, yep. that was, yeah, I had fun doing that. <laughs> okay. No, that's, I mean, and that's, at this point in time, we're still very early on you know i'm not expecting you guys to write massive things it's more just look at some code try and edit it try and understand it so awesome all right next which one do i open you provided like a whole bunch of files like, uh, uh, there was an image with it so yeah 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 so, so which is it was it the zip file or yeah, the other file. the zip file okay okay so that probably needs to be put in there Processing gets a bit fiddly about where the names of the files are. So I basically uh, took the basic uh, from the example, mm -hmm. the bouncing code, the bouncing ball code, mm -hmm. and then created with it. So I put a background image of a pinball game. Yep. And just wanted to <laughs> make a pinball game out of it. Okay. So change the landscape, change the ball size, just add in the background image. So what was, I probably should have said this, I should have made you guys upload the original or at least link to the original as well. So the, the original was the ball was bouncing off the side yeah, so and then, uh, yeah, so you added the background and the, um, the change of the size and everything. Cool. And how, how did you find that? Uh, just interesting, I loved it. Yeah? Wasn't? So I like commented everything that I liked. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Again, I'm not going to look through all this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I just want you guys to have an opportunity to, to do something. All right, lucky last. Okay, um, mine's a bit simple. Originally there was one of these top thing balls, like a big one. Mm -hmm. So I just made it have an offset to the bigger one and changed the color. Cool. And any, any major dramas or no? no? All worked fairly yeah. straightforward? Cool. Yeah. Cool. Any, any, uh, Things you would do differently? Um, no. Okay, so I can think of one thing. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, yours, yours is the perfect example in that, especially since you've gone from one to two, what you could have done is made this a function, and that way from your draw method, rather than copying and paste the code, you could have just called the function twice. Yeah. But, you know, again, this what's not an expectation, it's sort of, you know, next steps would be to do something like that. So that way, instead of having two balls, you could have three or four or as many as you wanted. So yeah, don't, don't I'm not trying to be critical or criticism. It's, it's more like, it's cool what you've done. And so I, you know, the next, next step would, which would be kind of cool. If you do want to keep trying is to try and make that into a function. Yeah. But obviously again, you guys are always welcome. If you have anything you've done that you're proud of and want to send and show off in front of the class, I'm happy to do that. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just trying to get you guys to, to actually have a play around with these things. Cool. And the rest of you are welcome to submit anything else if you'd like to do it for next week. Um, I'm on the, I don't think there's a dead due date on the assignment. So if you did do anything, you can just submit it to the assignment and go from there. Okay, cool. So just to refresher, uh, we talked about programming basics. We looked at uh, on Tuesday some of the things which are specific to processing. So the various draw functions, changing screen size, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then we sort of finished up by saying, okay, yep, so we've looked at some beginner stuff. Uh, we've looked at some intermediate stuff. And then I sort of talked about, and then there is some advanced stuff as well. Um, this code here, this code snippet doesn't actually do anything uh, because this is defining a class, uh, which we then can instantiate and will do stuff for us. And then I sort of said, well, that's all I'm going to talk about because we were running low on time. But I said we would come back and talk, to, talk about object-oriented programming. So now we're back to talk about object-oriented programming. Does anyone know what object-oriented programming is? No? 
everyone's trying to avoid making eye contact in the hopes that I won't ask them. So, okay, so everything we've talked about so far, um, when we've talked about programming, it's more like a, a set of instructions. So we say, okay, um, do this, then do that, and then do this, and then do that. And that was how programming uh, used to be done basically exclusively and you know, for the, the bulk of programming even these days, that is kind of what you do as a programmer. But I'm not here to give you a his history lesson and my dates are probably all wrong, but um, there was sort of this, there was a programming language came out I think in the 80s or 90s called Smalltalk uh, and it introduced, it probably again wasn't the first, but it was one of the more well-known ones, introduced this concept of object-oriented programming. So instead of us writing a program as a series of instructions, do this, do this, do this, do this, the object-oriented programming looks at um, a task and tries to break it down into various components. And each of those components we write individually, and then all we have to worry about is how those various components communicate with each other and that is how we create an object-oriented programming. So say we were doing a, uh, a program which simulated a lecture. Um, we would have a bunch of, or each of you guys would be perhaps a separate object, and each object would be capable of looking after itself, dealing with its own stuff. So we'd have you know, an object for a person, and that person would have a, a name and a age and stuff, and so they, each object has a set of data or information about them, but each object's able, also able to do some, or do some things. So uh, if we have a person object, we might, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself now, let's, let's think we have a student object and a lecturer object. So student objects, you know, you guys all have names and ages and degrees and all that sort of stuff. And then you have some functions, you can learn, and you can sleep, and you can eat. Um, hopefully do all three of those at some point in time. And then you'd have a lecturer object, and I also have a name and an age and everything. And I, I can sleep and eat, but I can also teach. And the idea is you guys don't actually need to know about how I do any of these things. That's, as long as I know how to do them myself, I can survive and do my job and I don't need to know about how you guys sleep and eat and learn. As long as you guys are capable of looking after yourselves, you can you know, do your degrees and do what you need to do. And so the idea behind object-oriented programming was would there be, I would be represented by an object and each of you individually would be um, represented by an object and us as objects would basically be responsible for um, doing everything that we need to do without needing to communicate between each other. So, if you think about our previous thing, previous code, we might have like a lecture function, and in that lecture function, there'd be something which does some teaching, a variable which does some teaching, and then some variables which do learning, and everything would sort of be intertwined and quite difficult to separate out. Whereas in object-oriented programming, we just have a, an object representing the lecturer, and the lecturer would just say teach, and would have objects for all the students, and would say learn and then everything would be responsible for taking care of itself and if we needed to go in and change some of that, we can go and do it, but we don't have to sort of figure out, okay, I need to tease all these parts apart and try and make sure that I fix parts without breaking other parts and so on and so forth. So the, the concept of the student and lecturer sort of becomes quite complicated, so we're going to look at some better ones to deal with today. But that's the rough idea. We're looking at how we can separate out uh, concepts of this is an individual object which is capable of doing its own thing. It has some, own, uh, some information about itself as well. And it comes down to this concept of encapsulation. Rather than having a program where all of the code is dispersed all amongst each other, um, we want to try and take a bunch of like-minded properties or data or information variables, whatever you want to call it, and some methods which operate on that data and try and put them into some logical coherent unit to say this is a, a car, for example. A car has a color and a car has a speed and a car has a position and a car can drive and it can start and stop and toot its horn and stuff. So it makes sense for all of that data to be in one place. Um, and then we'd have some other objects as well. And the other thing, we talked a little bit about scope before. Uh, when we, we were looking at variables, if you remember, and it was when we were looking at um, 
what is the difference between having something like void draw int x and having something like int x outside the draw method. So what is, the, what is the difference between the two of these? So if you remember, the scope was, if we have something like something like this, every time this draw method gets called, we create a variable called x, we add one to it, we print it out, and then as soon as we exit that, because of these squiggly lines in the scope, that x gets released, like the memory which has been allocated for it gets deleted, and it's forgotten, and then the next time we come back to this draw function, um, we set up x again and set it to zero. Whereas in this function, down here, by putting the x outside, the scope of that x is last for the entire program, so every time we come to this draw method, we're adding one to the last value, so it'll start at zero, the first time we call draw, it'll be one, second time it'll be two, third time it'll be three, so on and so forth. Does everyone remember that? Hopefully it still sort of makes sense. So the idea of scope when we get to object-oriented programming is that we can sort of say, well, the scope of this data is limited to the object. So I don't want you guys as students to be able to go and change my age, because that doesn't make sense. Like, that's not really something that you, sh you should have the ability to do. Um, I could have a birthday function which changes my age so every time it's my birthday it updates, but that's kind of my data. You guys shouldn't be allowed to change my age, my name, anything like that. You guys are only responsible for looking after yourselves. So that is where with object-oriented programming the concept of scope sort of comes in, in that in this encapsulating all the data and stuff, we're also basically limiting who has access to, to change that data. Okay. So I've done probably not the greatest job of explaining it so far because I've used some pretty bad examples, but we will be getting some better examples. But there is actually a really good um, discussion of object-oriented programming on processing on the processing website, which goes through quite a lot of detail and has examples you can copy and paste that uh, we're going to steal some stuff off. So again, you know, I won't feel offended if you don't think I've done a good job explaining this. Um, I'd like to think you'd, you'd talk to me first, but you can also go on there and read some extra information. Um, but we, so there is that information there, but we will be going through this in a, basically, probably, uh, maybe not for the rest of this lecture, but at least for a good chunk of this lecture anyway, we're going to be talking about object-oriented programming because it's kind of how things are done these days and when we get to Unity, which actually probably won't be too far from now, maybe next week. Um, everything is object-oriented programming, effectively. Like, everything in Unity is an object, whether you're aware of it or not. C++ is object-oriented? Yeah, so I mean, all, pretty much every language, well, no, that's not true. Most of the main languages these days will support some level of object-oriented programming. They'll support classes and objects, at least. Um, so C, C++, C Sharp, Java, processing, um, Python, Everything has this concept of classes and objects and stuff like that. How, where you want to draw the lines is what falls under object-oriented programming is probably up to debate. But I would argue that, yeah, certainly everything you're like, any of us are likely to use in our careers, unless you get down to like programming microcontrollers or stuff, um, is probably going to support object-oriented programming. So I know you've done a little bit of Unity and when we get to the Unity I will point out where we're talking about classes and objects and all that sort of stuff. Cool. All right, so um, this slide is titled Classes and Objects. We've talked about this concept of object-oriented programming. So what is the difference between a class and an object? So a class is kind of um, a template, I guess. A, a class describes what a particular, what are things which are common to all objects of that type. So if we had a um, a person class, for example, what are things which all people are capable of doing? All people have, all, what information exists for all people, what are all people capable of doing? So a person class might have a, a name, an age, a height, a weight, eye colour, hair colour, all these things that everyone has. Um, then they might all be able to eat and sleep and, uh, you know, learn and teach and everything. These are all things that people are capable of doing. So what an object is then is a specific instance of a class. So if we have this concept of 
a person class, then an object would be a particular person. So we could say all people can do this, and we're describing a class, but then we say Adrian is a person, Adrian is an object. So an object have a, objects have a type or a class which interests them, so Adrian is a person, so Adrian can do everything that a person can do, but he's a specific person, so he will have a name, he will have an age, he will have all these things, but they have specific values. Let me see if I can draw something on the board to, to illustrate that. Hopefully you guys know all of that stuff about alphabets. Okay, so let's come up with our person class. So a person has a name, age, height, and some other things. And they can do stuff. They can eat, they can sleep, they can learn, and so on and so forth. So this person class, this is the class. Is that readable? Maybe, hopefully, kind of. There's a blue pen over there, I'll try that. So this person class isn't actually describing any one person, it's describing all people. So anyone who is a person can do all these things. When we're talking about an object, we're talking about a specific person. So we have object Adrian, and Adrian is a, is a person. So we know because Adrian is a person, he has to have all these things. So Adrian has a name, which is Adrian, not surprising. He has an age, I think it's 35. <laughs> how bad is that? I can't even remember how old I am. Uh, he has a height, uh, I don't know what is in centimeters, but it's about six foot two. Um, and he's capable of doing some things. He can eat, he can sleep sometimes. Uh, he can learn sometimes. So this is de describing what every person can do and this is one person who can do all these things. And likewise, all of you guys, so your name's easy because you've only got two letters that I have to worry about. Um, trying to think who, are, who's, who else's name I can possibly spell without completely screwing things up and I'm not going to, the rest of you are just getting one letter. So that could be for either of you two and then that can be for you. Um, but each of you guys would be objects as well and how many of you are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got three. I'm not making the other people's boxes smaller because you mean any less. I'm just running out of whiteboard space. So each of you guys would have all of these things. You'd all have your own name, you'd all have your own age, you'd all have your own height, and you'd all be capable of doing these things. And so we have from one class multiple objects. Each would have their own, you know, we've got a name variable, so a string name, an age, which could be an integer, a height, which could be, if we did this, I, know, I think it's like 190 something. Uh, and the height, which is an integer, which is your height in centimeters. All of these are variables, but they're all your variables. They're all specific to you. I can't go in and change your names or your ages or your heights because that's your information for you to deal with. So for a, another example, if we had a car class, for example, um, try and keep some consistency in color. So the class, which is a car and it has a color, and a position, and speed, and then it can drive, and some other stuff. Then we might have, you know, a Ferrari object, and um, a Fiat object and so on and so forth. Probably more specific than these since these are car companies. So it would be, you know, um, LJ's Ferrari and Gonzalo's Fiat and Adrian's piece of crap, which is probably going to fail its warrant today. But each of those would be specific, actual, physical, tangible 
implementations. There's no, there's no concept of a car. I can't go out and actually touch the concept of a car, but I can touch a specific car, and that specific car will have some information about it which actually exists. So, yeah, the example here I've said a car could be a class, so we have this concept and abstract idea of what a car is in our head, and then there's actually a physical, physical Ferrari which is in the car park which we can go out and actually touch. That is actually a, a physical object which exists. Okay, so let's write our first class. And you're all welcome to join in. So the first thing we need to do when we're creating a class is to write the word class. And then we need to give it a name. So this class will be, uh, again, this abstract idea of something. So let's run with the car object, uh, car class, sorry. So we have a class called a car. And just like everything else, it has some squiggly brackets. The squiggly brackets basically define the scope of that class. So everything which is between these two squiggly brackets is going to be what makes a car a car. So I talked about a few things. Uh, let's give it a color. So we haven't talked about color yet, but color is a, um, a, is a variable type in, in processing. Um, oops, wrong one. If we go back to here and check out the reference manual, so it's color with no U because it's American English. But color is a, is a variable uh, type, so we can assign some values to it in various ways. Um, let's just stick with doing it with RGB because that's the most sensible way, I think. But because, whoops, I don't want to open that one. Because this is a, um, because this is a, uh, an abstract concept, we're actually not going to give it a color because, I mean, if I said what color is a car, you wouldn't say it's red, it's blue. It's, you'd say what car. So you're asking me for the object. So for the concept, the abstract concept of a car, it doesn't actually have a color. Uh, we'll give it a position. We're going to do um, two values, position X and position Y which is its X and Y position, so X is its horizontal, Y is its vertical, just like when we were drawing rectangles the other day. And let's give it a speed as well. So we now have basically said that every car, and I've called it car color because I can't use the word color again, um, and everything else I've just called what it is. But we, we, we've said every car has to have a color, every car has to have an X position and a Y position, and every car has to have a speed. These are things that every car has. So we've basically set up this concept of a car that has some data, some information about it. And I can now go and uh, actually create some cars if I want. So I have the setup method. So this, this class is um, defining the class. The setup method is just regular processing like we've already written a dozen times before. So now, if I want to create an object of that car, what I do is just like any other variable, I'd say what sort of object it is, it's going to be a car, and then I give it a name. So in this case, my car is called Ferrari. And I can just say equals new car. So we've seen this concept of new, I think, with arrays, and I sort of talked about when we see the new keyword, it's basically saying, put some memory aside. I want to I wanna store something. And just like we'd say int my array equals new int 5, we'll create, no we won't. Uh, how did we do that? I can't even remember how we create arrays now. Because that's one thing which seems to be different in every programming language we use. Ah, oh, duh. Um, so just like we'd say, this is a, an integer array of my array and I want to put aside some memory to store five ints in it. Here we're saying int Ferrari equals new car, so I'm going to create a new Ferrari and I want you to put some memory aside for it. Cool. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep, so we've created a, we've created a Ferrari, we've told the thing in our little pigeon box, pigeon holes, to put some memory aside, I'm going to stick a car in it, and I want you. I want to refer to that piece of memory as a Ferrari. As Ferrari. So if I want to change some values of this Ferrari, what I do is I say Ferrari, and then I use the dot. 
And the dot basically says that this is an object and I want to change some variable of that object or I want to call some function of that object. So Ferrari dot basically says for this piece of memory that holds this Ferrari car, I want to change its car color. And I'm going to give it the color 25500, which is red. So I've said set the Ferrari car color variable, this one here, to the color red. Likewise, I'm going to say set the Ferrari's position X to 0, set the Ferrari's position Y to 0, uh, now I'm going to set it to 100, and set the Ferrari's speed to 100. Cool. So I can then go and print out any of these things I want. Uh, let's say print the Ferrari speed. And when I run this code, it will say 100. So what we've done so far isn't really that amazing. You know, rather than having car color position X position Y as a class, I could have actually just had them out here, color Ferrari color int Ferrari position X and so on and so forth and just filled out all these things. The problem comes when, let me finish writing these, position Y. So I could have done exactly the same thing here rather than actually having a, a class and an object, I could have just said, well, let's just say Ferrari car color, Ferrari position X, Ferrari position Y. Oh. Um, Ferrari speed, and that'll all work just fine. They're just variables, They're nothing, there's nothing special about them. Where, the, where this becomes advantageous is now, what if I want to add another variable, uh, another car? I want to add the, the Fiat. Well, I'm going to have to copy all of these again. And another car, I'm going to have to copy these all again, and so on and so forth. For every additional car I want, if I'm representing thousands of cars, that's going to become quite a chore. So, but because it's a class, or if I want to create another car, all I have to do is say, okay, let's create my Fiat. And all of a sudden, all of that memory for all of those variables and everything has been set up for me. And I can just say Fiat.car color equals color 00255. So this is a blue Fiat. And all of that's taken care of. I don't need to keep copying and pasting variables and try to remember what every variable is. I just have to say create a new car and everything that a car gets, I get set up for me for free. All right, so is that cool? Everyone's happy with that, more or less? Scroll way too far back. Okay, so every class has a name when we're creating it. So we've said there's a class car, abstract idea of a car. Every class has some data, well, most likely has some data. So variables which are specific to that, that class or those objects that we're going to be creating. A, a color, a position, a speed. So there's a special, ver well there's, every class has a method as well, but we'll come back to that in a second. But every class has a constructor. So there's something special that I haven't told you about this new car. So when I create a new car, I said it sets aside some memory in the computer that basically will store a car and I can go and I can change all those things. But what actually happens behind the hood, or under the hood, haha, <laughs> car pun, is it will actually call the special function that every class has called the constructor, which sets up the class, sets up all its variables and stuff like that. So the simplest constructor, so the constructor always has the same name as the class, and the simplest constructor will look like that. So this is a function that takes no arguments, does nothing, returns nothing. Does And effectively, if I don't add a constructor, if I just have like that, this is what processing will stick in there for me. There's a constructor which does nothing. So to show you guys that this is getting called, I can put a print statement in here. If I can spell, which I can't. And if we run this now, you'll see called car constructor. So I'm not actually explicitly calling this function here, you don't see it. But it happens when I write new car. It knows that I'm creating a new car, put aside some memory, and also call the constructor if the user wants to set up anything. So you can have, uh, a constructor can have as few or 
as many arguments as you want. So say I want to, that when a user creates a car, they have to specify the color. So I can just put that in as an argument to my constructor and you'll notice that now this has turned red when I run on it, it run it, it says the constructor car car is undefined because there is no constructor which takes no arguments. There's a constructor which takes color, but there's no constructor which takes no arguments. So, okay, let's stick that color in there and you'll see everything, uh, the, the error goes away and when I run this, everything works fine again. So what I can do with my constructor is I can actually use that to allow me to very easily set up my car. So I've passed, I've basically said there is a constructor which takes a new car color and when that constructor runs, I'm gonna set my car color to be that new car color. So now instead of having say, car Ferrari equals new car, Ferrari.car color equals this, I can actually just do it straight in my constructor. That when this creates the Ferrari, it's going to pass in the color red and it's going to say, okay, this Ferrari, let's set its car color to red. And I can do the same thing with position. Pause, int, pause, y, and with the speed. And set all of these things. So we've passed in, we've, our construction now takes four arguments the color of the car I want, the position, X position of the car I want, the Y position of the car I want, and the speed that it's traveling at. And so instead of having all of these setup functions to set up all of the um, variables for this Ferrari, I can just pass them straight in in the constructor as the X position, the Y position, and the speed. And now to create my Ferrari, I only need this one line of code. And you'll notice that Ferrari speed is still 100. Instead of setting it automatically, or manually rather, I'm setting it in the constructor, so everything's being set up. And that actually makes it way easier if I wanna create my Audi now. I can say, let's create my blue Audi, and it's gonna be at 100, whoops, by 10, traveling at a speed of 50. And if I print out my Audi speed now, We'll see, get, we'll see, we'll get the Ferrari speed, which is 100, and the Audi speed, which is 50. I can still go and change these later as well. I can say Audi.speed equals 70, and when I run this, you'll see it's now at 70. So I still have the option of changing them manually, but the constructor allows me to automatically set everything up when I create the object. And like any other function, we can override or overload our constructor, so I can have one which takes no arguments, and so when I say car um, Nissan equals new car, I can construct that with no arguments. I just have no idea what these values will be until I set them up manually. Or I could have one which just takes a color. And so car color equals new car color. And now I can create my car and I can say, well, I just, at this point in time, the only thing I know about it is it's a green Nissan. Um, so I'll create a green Nissan and I'll set up the position and the speed and everything later on. So that's the constructor. It's a nice little, constructors aren't necessary. They're a nice convenient function to allow you to say, when I create this object, I want it to have all these properties. Cool. Um, that all makes sense? Any questions about that? No? So the other thing actually which you can do in a constructor is so I, I said before we're not going to give um, cars a color because if I said to you guys what color is a car you'd ask me what car. So uh, you know there's this concept that cars don't have a color by default but let's say they did. Let's say by default unless I've resprayed my car it's black. What I could actually do is I could say well if I'm not given a color let's set its color to black. And this way, when I, if I call car, um, what's another type of car, Honda, if I call it with no arguments, it's just going to say, well, it hasn't, you haven't told me what color the car should be. By default, it's black. It's always going to be a black car. Um, and we can do that with all, these, all of the other variables as well. If, we don't have, if we're not given a position, uh, let's give it a position. 
And if it's not given a speed, let's give it a speed. And I can do these as many as I want or don't want in any of the constructors. So if I'm only given, or rather if I'm given no arguments, set it black, position zero, or position x zero, position y 100, speed zero. If I'm given a color, set the color. Otherwise, when I'm giving it, given everything, just copy those variables across. So it's a, you know, constructors are a convenience more than a necessity. You can do all these things later on. You can create your current set all its values. But having constructors allows you to very quickly say, well, I'm going to have a car. I don't know what color it is, so just set it up with some default values. Or I'm going to specify the color, so set the color and give, set everything else to default. Or I'm going to pass in everything and set it all up in one go. So that's constructors. So some things to note, constructors always have to have the same name as the class. They get called when we call new class names. So when the object gets created, it'll create it calling that. They don't have a return type, so it's not void car. Um, it's not int car, it's not whatever, because cars don't actually return anything, or constructors don't return anything. We can't use them to do some calculations and then return a value. All they do is set up something. And they can have as many arguments or as few arguments as they want. And they can have as many, much in, that they do as we want. So they can set up a bunch of stuff, they can not set up some stuff, they can call some functions, they can do whatever. They're a regular function, they just have a few special properties. Okay, and then the last thing we want to talk about is methods. So cars can do something. So my car can drive, and when my car drives, uh, we're just going to increase the x position by speed. So we're going to move it speed pixels every time we call drive. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to write a draw method um, for the car. So you'll see it's highlighted it. Just ignore that. It's because it's inside a class, it's not going to treat it fine. This is actually arguably a mistake of processing. It shouldn't highlight this. This isn't the draw method. This is the car's draw method. So this won't get called. If I put a, a print statement in here, it won't get called when the function runs because it's not the actual draw method, it belongs to the car. So that highlighting is a mistake. If I gave it anything else, any other name, it wouldn't highlight it. Actually, let's do that so we don't get too confused. So my car, <coughs> sorry, my car class, so my abstract concept of a car has a color, it has a position, it has a speed. We know when we create a new car, we can give it zero arguments and by default it'll be black. It'll be at this position, it'll have this speed. We can say create a new car with this color and I'll set that color and otherwise it'll set everything, set everything else by default. And we have a constructor which takes positions and speeds and colors and if so, we'll set all those things up. Uh, our car, every car can drive and we know when a car drives, it's basically increasing its exposition by some speed and we have a draw function which I'm just going to say um, fill car color so it's going to set the fill before the draw so if you remember fill if we draw a shape will be the color inside it set that to the color of the car and then we're going to draw a rectangle at position x position y and every car is 100 pixels wide by 50 pixels high so drawing a car basically just draws a rectangle of the color of the car color at the car's position X and position Y. Make sense? Hopefully it's okay. All right, so let's actually make our cars do something interesting now. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is, if you remember our, uh, um, our talk on scope, because these, all of these variables are in the setup method, their scope is the setup method. So they're going to immediately get destroyed as soon as the setup function ends. So I'm actually just going to shift these out of the setup method so that I can access them later on. So I can move them all out like that and everything's fine. These cars just exist as long as my program exists now. So what I'm going to do now is in my draw function, I'm going to say for every car, because draw runs every time, the pr every time it can, or as fast as it can, I'm going to tell my Ferrari to drive and then I'm going to tell my Ferrari to draw. <coughs> and now if I run this code, we will hopefully see... Draw car. Thank you. It's called draw car now. 
And actually in my setup function, let's increase the size of the window so we can see something. In my draw function, let's set the background to white so it's clear. And if I run my function now, nope, you very briefly saw a red blur across the screen. That's my Ferrari, it's really, really fast. Um, okay, so let's slow our Ferrari down. So our Ferrari currently is moving 100 pixels per draw frame. That's probably a little bit crazy. Let's set it to 10 and we can see there goes my Ferrari. Drives across the screen. Okay, um, let's change our drive function so that it doesn't just drive off the end of the screen and disappear forever. Let's say if the position X is greater than width, so width is a special variable that we haven't talked about so far, but it stores the width of the window. So if I say down here, um, size 512, 512, the width will be set to 512. So I can access that really easy later on. So basically we're saying if position X, the X position of the car, or the horizontal position of the car is greater than the width of the window, so it's driven off the end of the window. Nope. Let's set position X back to zero. So if it's driven off the end of the window, put it back at the start of the window. So now my car's gonna just keep on driving non-stop. And sure enough, there goes my Ferrari and it just drives from one side of the window and then pops back. Okay, so that's my Ferrari. What about the rest of my cars? Uh, well, we have an Audi. And we can tell that to drive and we can tell that to draw itself as well. And now we have our Ferrari and we have our Audi. And we haven't actually had to add a huge amount of code to add this extra car. Really, we have three lines of code. One to set up our Audi, um, and then one to drive it and one to draw it. So you can think when we were talking before about if we had, if we didn't use a class, if we had a Ferrari car color and a Ferrari position, Ferrari rara, every time we added a new code, we'd have to, a, a new function, we'd have to add basically everything which is in our class to set that up. We'd have to have Ferrari car color, Ferrari position X, Ferrari position Y, Ferrari speed. And then in our drive function, we'd have to say Ferrari position X plus equals Ferrari speed. If Ferrari position X is greater than width, Ferrari position uh, fill, Ferrari car color, fill, uh, ripped, Ferrari position X, Ferrari position Y. So we're adding, you know, about what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, at least eight lines of code for every car we're adding, whereas here we have to add three. It's not a huge saving, but if these were more complicated cars or whatever, you can see that, you know, perhaps they'd be a bit better. So we have a, a few other cars. We have a Nissan. Um, this is pretty close to my Nissan in that uh, it doesn't move. Um, <laughs> so it's just sitting there because I didn't actually give it a speed. So I could up here, you can see it's, it's created as a green one. My car's not green, but we can pretend. But I could say, okay, um, let's make this a little bit more like my car and set its speed to one. So it can drive, but it's just very slow. Um, likewise, that's not in really the best position. Let's change its uh, position Y to be 150. So there we go, there's my, my car driving very slowly while everyone flies past me at 100 mile an hour. Um, and we have a Honda as well that we could put it, throw in there if we so decided. And that's even slower than my car and it's not moving at all and it's black because by default we've said that cars are black. So we could, you know, I've set the Nissan's position Y and speed here, but I could just as easily say uh, 100 by 150 by one. And for this one, let's do the same thing. Let's give it, uh, let's make it a purple Honda, um, which starts at 80, is at 200 and has a speed of two. And now we have four cars which are all sort of doing their own thing, driving along. And the kind of nice thing about this is it's really easy for me to add more and more cars. I just add an extra three lines of code and they'll do themselves. Um, you know, the cars are responsible for their driving, the cars are responsible for their draw link, drawing. All I'm responsible for as the person who writes the processing program is just telling the car to draw, telling the car to drive, and setting the car up. So you can imagine one of the other advantages to um, object-oriented programming and this idea of having classes and um, you know they have their own variables and they have their own methods and everything, is I could have actually given to guys, can you go write a car class for me? 
and you guys could have gone off and written that car class and you could have just said, okay, you, the, the name of the class is called car, the constructor takes a color, a position X, a position Y and a speed and it has two variables, drive and draw and I would actually never have to see the code for this class. All I would have to know is how to construct it and how to draw it and everything would just work. So it's sort of, in addition to encapsulating things to make it a little bit more sensible, I don't have to worry about, oh, you know, I have to copy and paste all this code to get it to do the thing. All I have to do is call ferrari.drive, ferrari.drawcar. It also allows me to encapsulate in a way that I can give you guys a nice chunk to take off and write your own car class and do everything. And then um, all I have to worry about is how do I use it? How do I construct it? What methods and functions do I use to have to uh, get my Ferrari to do something? All right, let's take a short break there. Um, and then when we come back, we'll, we'll finish off the object-oriented programming, probably, hopefully. Yes, just touch on it too because um, I think it is actually quite important. Okay, so those, for those of you who um, weren't really paying, or weren't paying attention to that, that's fine, we're on a break, but uh, it's actually, I think, probably a, a, an important thing worth, worth realizing. Okay, so we've quickly whipped up this example um, of a, a course. So each course has some students. Um, actually, no. I'm going to create a new one to make it even simpler. So we're going to have a lecturer, whoops, and we're going to have a course. So a lecturer has a name, we have a constructor for the lecturer which takes a new name and assigns that new name to the name. We have a course and each course has a lecturer in it. So the question, well, I guess it wasn't really the question, but where we sort of got to with that is we can create our course um, mhits 603 as a new course and we can create a course mhits 602 as a new course and everything there was like the car example we did before. So we have two courses, one for 603, one for 602. They're both courses. Sorry, he'll have to come back. I think he's probably installing the, or doing something with the windows. Um, so we have mhit 603 and mhit 602, which are new courses. And we know when we call new course, it puts aside some memory for us, for us to do some stuff with. So each of these courses has a lecturer. So I can say mhit 603 lecturer, keeping in mind that even though this is a, a class or an object, uh, it's treated no differently than if it was an integer if it was an integer or a string or anything like that. So I can assign its value. I can say mhit 603 lecturer, but because this is a, an object, I need to say that it's a new lecturer and I need to give it a name, Adrian. And we'll do one for 602, Sung Chul. And if I print out those values, 603.lecturer.name so let's do mhit 603, because we know which one we're looking at, and mhit 602. And again, I'll make all of these examples live so you can try. Okay, so we have two courses. Each course has one variable, called, which is a lecturer, and a lecturer has one variable, which is a name, and it has a constructor, which just sets up that name when we pass it in. So we create two courses, one for mhit 602 and one for mhit 603. And we say the mhit 603 lecturer is a new lecturer, Adrian, and the mhit 602 lecturer is a new lecturer, Sung Chul. And then we print out um, the, the course code mhit 603, mhit 602, along with the lecturer's name who is attached to that. And for mhit 603, we have Adrian, as we've set up here, and for mhit 602 we have Sung Chul as we've set down here. Is everyone happy with that? So it's sort of, it's one step on top of what we were doing before with the cars. So now instead of just having one class which with a few primitive data types, we have 
a class which contains a class with a primitive data type. Okay, so um, I'll try and draw these out a little bit bigger so you can hopefully see them better. So what you what we have to remember is when we have this new keyword, it means we're telling the computer, can you please give us some memory that we can put some stuff in. So the first thing we see is mhit603 is new course. So we get some memory of type course and it's called mhit603. Then we see the next one, mhit602 equals new course. And then we have some new lecturers down here, one with the name Adrian, one with the name Sung Chul. So we have a lecturer and another lecturer, and one is Adrian, and one is Sung Chul. Now these ones don't actually have, because we've never said lecturer x equals new lecturer Adrian, lecturer y equals new lecturer Adrian. We don't actually have direct references, so we can't just say x, x dot name, y dot name. Instead, we've said mhit603 dot lecturer equals new lecturer Adrian, mhit602 lecturer dot equals new lecturer Sung Chul. So these actually have a variable in them called lecturer, these courses. And effectively, if I wanted to get access to Adrian or Sung Chul, that's what I'd need to do. So I'd need to say mhit603 dot lecturer, and that will allow me to access this lecturer, or mhit602 dot lecturer will allow me to access that lecturer. Happy with that? Yep. It's hopefully okay. So what gets a little bit confusing is what happens when I do, so let's say this is version one. What happens if I do version two, where Sung Chul has, is no longer teaching with us and I'm now teaching both courses. So if we run this, it looks fine. MHIT 603's lecturer is Adrian, MHIT 602's lecturer is Adrian. Looks like it's probably fine. But what happens if, say, I decide to change my name? Adrian isn't cool enough, and I want to change my name to the Fonz from Happy Days. So if I run this now, MHIT 603's lecturer is now the Fonz, but MHIT 602 lecturer is still Adrian. So what's going on there? So this is, I put dash dash one, that one doesn't mean anything to the computer, it's just for us to hopefully understand. This is what's happening in version one. We have two courses, 603, 602. We have two lecturers, Adrian and Sung Chul. So this is, the second one down now is lecture two. And some of it's gonna be the same. So the first three chunks at least are going to be as we expected, I'm not going to write the full names because I'm really slow at writing, um, and that's the lecturer, and that's Adrian, which is pointed to by the 603 lecturer. So that part's all the same. However, when I call mhit602 lecturer equals new lecturer Adrian here, every time we see new, regardless of anything else, every time we see new, we know we have to put aside some new memory. That's what it means. So what actually happens is we create a new lecturer and we set its name to Adrian. And then we say mhit602, his lecturer, or its lecturer, sorry, should be Adrian. So now we actually have two separate lecturer objects. They just both co coincidentally happen to have the name Adrian. So when I say mhit 603lecturername the fonts, what I'm actually doing is just changing that one. 
there for the fonts. So there's still a whole other lecturer object out there which has the name Adrian because we called new lecturer twice. They're, they're actually different pieces of memory and really that's, I guess, the difficulty for us. We think of Adrian as being an immutable, immutable object. There is only one Adrian. Um, but in reality, the computer doesn't care. All it sees is here's one piece of memory, here's another piece of memory. Those two pieces of memory are different. The fact that this one string is the same actually means nothing to me. So what if I actually wanted to make sure that both of these lecturers were being lectured by the same person so that we, um, if, I, if I did change my name to the Fonz, all of your courses would be taught by the Fonz rather than today you have to call me the Fonz and tomorrow you can call me Adrian again. And the key to that is to think about it from a, a computer standpoint. How do we create a new lecturer? Well, we call this new method. So let's actually have um, a lecturer which was, we'll just give it, no, I don't want to give it the name Adrian because I'm going to change my name. Um, that guy. So what we've done now is we have our two lectures. Should have thought this through a little bit better. But we have our two lectures, 603, 602, and we have one more new, that guy. And that one has a lecturer, that one has a lecturer, and this guy has a name called Adrian. And then what we could do is say, mhit 603.lecturer equals that guy m hit 602 lecturer equals that guy. And now if I run this, we'll see both of them have the name of the fonts. Because what we've done is we've said, okay, new course 603, new course 602, new lecturer, that guy. Then we've said the 603's lecturer should be that guy. The 602's lecturer should be that guy. And then I probably should have commented that out originally, but I didn't. Down here, we say mhit 603 lecturer name the fonts. So we've changed, we've said mhit 603's lecturer, which is this guy, change his name to the fonts. And now when we ask what's the what's the name of the lecturer of 602, we say 602.lecturer, which is pointing to this piece of memory. What's that name? The fonts. So that guy using a reference on It is exactly a reference, yep. So and then in fact the term reference in um, it does exist quite in quite a lot of languages, and it's for that exact reason. Like if you pass in, if you pass a piece of data to a class or something, you can pass it as a copy, which means that it will allocate some new memory and pass that across. So if you change it, it doesn't affect the original, or you can pass it by reference. In which case, if I change it, it will change the original. But again, that's getting a little bit further down that path than we probably want to at the top at this time. But likewise, what I could do is, because these all point to the same thing, I could, rather than saying mhit 603.lecture equals name, I could just say that guy's name is now the fonts, and it will do the same thing. Because we're just, we're only affecting this piece of memory here. Whereas before, we had two lecturers, and two lecturers, here we only have one lecturer, and we just say both of these uh, courses here should use that same lecturer. So it's getting a little bit abstract now. I try and try and shield you guys for this as much as possible for as long as possible, but unfortunately at the end of the day, you do have, there is a bit of a change in how you have to think about these things. We're so used to um, understanding the world based on physical constraints. You know, we can't just make a copy of a person, but we totally can do that when we're programming. And so sometimes you have to eventually sort of give up your way of understanding how things work from our real life experiences and just think about it, what is it the computer actually doing behind the scenes here? When I call new, it's creating some new memory and filling that out. So despite the fact I say new lecturer Adrian, new lecturer Adrian, the computer all that sees is two new statements, two pieces of memory, both are individual. And to really um, maybe try and sort of should bring that point home. So rather than printing out the lecturer's name, what I can actually do is if I say 
just lecture without name, what that's going to do is it's actually going to print out how that's internally stored in processing. So if you see here, if I say mhit 603lecturer we've got a bunch of stuff in here which doesn't make a huge amount of sense, but we've got mhit2 or mhit $2 lecturer at 72D2 DDD. But basically this is how this is stored the memory. So basically this last part here is the actual place in memory that it stored it. And this first bit here is what kind of data type it is. It's an M hit lecturer. The dollar two and the at sign are pretty much irrelevant for us. So in this case, both both of the M hit 603 le dot lecturer and M hit 602 lecturer are pointing at this piece of memory 72D2 DDD. And you think you can think about this. If you go to the library, you want to get a book out. And the librarian will say, oh, it's Dewey Decimal number is 603.112. That is basically a, a reference which tells you whereabouts in the library you need to go to get that book. And it's exactly the same thing here. This memory address just tells you whereabouts in the computer's memory that that object is stored. So if I changed this back to our original one, where we say mhit 603lecturer adrian mhit 602lecturer adrian and then run this again we'll see that despite the fact they both have new lecture Adri lecturer adrian they both point to different memory addresses and so sometimes this can be a good way of checking things out you don't necessarily need to understand what these things are but if you think that these should have the same lecturer you can just print out that value and if these two things are different then you know that in its memory it's pointing to two separate different objects. Hopefully you'll never run into that case, but you know, depending on how much programming you do, there is a good chance that eventually you will accidentally create a new object when actually you just wanted to use the same one for doing multiple jobs. Okay, so again, I'll make this all live. You guys are welcome to, to copy and paste and, and try different things, just like you did, some of you did for the homework assignment you can try and play with some of these things and see if you can understand what's going on behind the scenes. Okay, so the last few slides in this um, are just stolen straight off that uh, processing website uh, objects thing. Again, highly recommend reading this in addition to the course. It does go over everything we've talked about. Possibly does a better job at some parts, possibly does a worse job, I don't know, hopefully not better all over because otherwise what are you doing in the class? You should just be reading the website and you'll be fine. But yeah, um, worth reading anyway. And so here's the car class that comes off the website and it's kind of roughly what we wrote anyway. So we have the, the class name, it has some data, the values of them are slightly different. Um, it has a constructor, uh, it has a display method, we called it draw, display would have been a better idea. Uh, there's some functions that we haven't seen rect mode before. All rect mode does is normally when we normally when we draw rect using this rect function, we'll have x position, y position. I'm oh sorry, x position this way, y position this way, width that way, and height that way. So that's when we normally call rect, we give it the x value, which says how far from the left, the y value, which says how far from the top, and then the width and height of the size of the rectangle. Um, when we call rect mode center, what that actually means is the x position tells us where the center of our rectangle should be, the y position tells us where this, well, horizontally, the y position tells us the center of the rectangle vertically. And then we have the width and the height as normal. So basically it's just saying when I draw a rectangle, I want the x and y position to be at the center of the rectangle versus the, the top. That's literally all that one line does is just change it from the top left to the center. So you can pretty much forget about that. And then everything else is the same. Uh, when we call drive, we increase the exposition by the speed. If it goes past the width, we set it to zero, so on and so forth. 
Uh, and this is basically some code that I wrote a long time ago, so we could just copy and paste it, but it's, I think it's good to go through it in class and actually type it out rather than copying and pasting it. So to use our car, we declare it, and then we initialize it by calling new in the constructor. We actually didn't do this before, but this is another way. So I've closed my car. So rather than having car Ferrari equals new car, blah, 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 blah. And here, what we could do is we could just say car Ferrari here, and that will tell us we're gonna have a car Ferrari. Don't bother putting aside any memory or anything for it at the moment. Um, and then our setup function we say, okay, now put aside some memory for that Ferrari. The, the difference between the two is minimal, basically. Um, and, in and for this specific example, it actually makes no difference at all. It's only if you don't want to allocate the memory right now, you just want to do a little bit later. Uh, but in this case, there's no harm in allocating everything at the start. It's not like we're loading um, you know, a movie or like a lot of images or something that might use up all our memory. If we're just creating a few objects like this, it's fine. But one of the <coughs> earlier one of the earlier classes examples for the programming assignment that to make an MP3 player, and in that case, the, you don't want to load the MP3 until the user's selected it. So in that case, you know you might say MP3 my MP3, and then later on you load it because there's no point loading it until the person's decided which one they want to load. So yeah, that's, that's basically the difference between what we did before and what we've done here. Here we've said there's gonna be an object and by putting it out here, it means that the scope of that object is the entire program and then we initialize it a bit later. But putting that new car up here which gives us the same result for this example. Um, and then the draw, we do uh, set the background, drive and display. And again, we can create multiple objects car, my car equals new car. Uh, we can create multiple objects by doing the same thing. We can have initial values if we have multiple constructors. Um, and we can have multiple constructors by just basically having constructors with different arguments. All right, everyone happy with that? Yep. Okay, so that is our introduction to processing, which took a little bit longer than normal, but that's fine because we have plenty of time. Um, so we'll just, diff un unless anyone has any questions on that, we're gonna start dipping our toes into the processing themes now. No, everyone's happy? Cool, okay, we won't go too far down this um, today or generally at all because I feel like it's probably more useful for you guys to know Unity since there's probably like a much smaller percentage of students do their MHIT or use processing and stuff for their MHIT compared to Unity or one of these other things. So, but in saying that, you know, it is a good prototyping tool and it's worth sort of learning a little bit about. So we're gonna go, we've got a few slides which talk about uh, what I have referred to as themes because I'm pretty sure in your programming interactivity books they call them themes, but that's just doing stuff beyond just writing a program. So we're looking at things like interaction. How do we support interaction and in processing? So let me close some of these down. Again, I'll upload them all. Um, so we've talked, we've looked at some of these things a few times, or not a few times, we've looked at some of these things before. Um, so in processing we have, if we say in our draw method, uh, we have a bunch of variables that we can query to find out stuff about the current state of our mouse. So we saw mouse X and mouse Y. Make our window a little bit bigger. So we saw mouse six and mouse Y uh, on Tuesday from memory when we were talking about how we could create our own button by figuring out where the mouse is. So just to, as a quick reminder, mouse X and mouse Y represent the X on the, the first number is the X position, so how far horizontal it is. And Y is the second value, which is the vertical um, value of the mouse position. 
And there's a bunch of other things we could look at as well. Um, there is a variable called mouse pressed, which will return false when nothing's being pressed and true when something is being pressed. Uh, bear with me one second. Sorry, I should have brought this earlier. So for a track or a Mac trackpad where it's kind of difficult to double click, it's well, it's a little bit less obvious. <coughs> so you'll notice false, left button is true, right button is true, center button is true, they all return true. Mouse press just returns true if a button is being pressed. What if I want to know what button? Well, I can also then print out mouse button like that. Actually, let's put them side by side. So otherwise you won't be able to tell which is which. Um, so if mouse pressed is false, no buttons have been pressed yet, it's zero. I push the left button, it's 37. And it will stay 37 because it just records the last time a button was interacted with. Right button is 39 and middle button is three. Obviously makes sense, 37, 39, three, we can all remember that. Um, <laughs> It's all right, you don't actually have to remember that because uh, we, what we can do is if mouse button, if mouse pressed, so if the user has pressed a button, if mouse button equals left, left button pressed, else if mouse button equals right, right button pressed, else. So there is a couple of um, variables left and right in all capitals. Uh, so if it's a constant value which never changes, um, processing puts them in all capitals and hopefully if I've done this right, left button pressed, right button pressed. So the if I want to check to see if it was the left button or the right button, I don't need to remember that one is 37 the other is 39. I can just use left and right. Uh, I have a feeling there might be middle, but there's not. Um, so in that case, if you want to check if it was the middle button, just check if it wasn't the left or right. They will have different numbers, which if you really want to get specific, you can check, but it's probably easier to say left, right, middle. So just check, in, instead of having to remember the, the values for them, there's a left and a right. Uh, is there maybe a center? Oh, there is, there we go. Maybe it's if mouse button equals center. There we go, middle button pressed. So left, right, and center you can use um, to check which button has been pressed. Can you use the same number? <coughs> Uh, do you mean like instead of having so 30 like that you said? Yeah, of course. So left is just a variable that has the number 37 in it. Um, so you could imagine in somewhere in processing code it will have something like int left equals 37. So that you just don't need to remember that left is 37, you can just say if it's left. Um, and there is one other thing in here, p mouse x and p mouse y, which can be quite useful. We'll just show a short example. Um, so, uh, there is a function called line in processing which will draw a line between two values. So 10, 10, 20, 20 has drawn a line from 10, 10 to 20, 20. So what I can do is I can say if mouse button, uh, no, if mouse pressed, so if someone's pressed the button, let's draw a line from the current mouse position, mouse x, mouse y, and then we have p mouse x, p mouse y, which store the position of the mouse the last time draw was called. So if I run this code now, I can actually draw on the screen, because when I, whenever I hold the button down, 
I'm drawing a line from where the mouse was the last time draw was called to where it was the current time draw was called. So I can have a drawing program simply by having this p mouse x and p mouse y. I could store the value myself. I could say um, int last mouse x last mouse y and then down here say at the end of the function last mouse x equals mouse x last mouse y equals mouse y and put that in there so at the end the end of the function I store the mouse x and mouse y and then the next time I come around it'll still have those last values and we'll see if it works in exactly the same way but p mouse x and p mouse y are just a convenience function that processing included to make it a little bit easier so mouse x and mouse y the current mouse positions p mouse x and p mouse y the previous mouse position mouse pressed has a button been pressed mouse button which button was last interacted with was it pressed or released so in processing there is multiple ways of doing everything so i could have a draw function like i've got here um, where we have mouse press and so on and so forth but perhaps i want to do lots of things with the mouse and i want to do lots of things with the keyboard i might end up with a really massive draw function which becomes a bit of a nightmare to use so what you can do instead of doing that is processing provides functions for testing a bunch of these things. So I could say void mouse pressed and that function will fire when I push the button. So it's exactly the same, well almost actually, let's, let's get rid of this. It's almost exactly the same as writing almost exactly the same but not exactly the same so the difference is mouse pressed only gets called when the mouse is pressed draw gets called constantly and then we check has them or is the mouse being pressed in which case we draw this so what happens if I just comment this out for a second so if we actually just make this a little bit bigger if I press the mouse button in a way that I can see it with just the mouse pressed function, uh, uh, that one, that one. So if I press the mouse button with just the mouse pressed function, one time. Or basically every time it gets pressed, it will print out one. If I have the draw function, because the draw function gets called 30 times a second or whatever, and 30 times a second we're checking is the mouse being pressed, if we watch, it just keeps printing it over and over again. So we'll see at the top of this function, or this big line of draw things, we'll see mouse press. So it did get called, but it only got called once. Whereas the draw method got called 30 times a second and checked. So depending on what you want to do, if you only want to detect when the person presses the button and only once, it might be good to use the mouse press function. If you want to check to see constantly are they holding down the button, putting it in the draw function is probably better. Likewise, there's a bunch of other functions. Void mouse released. So now if I click on this, mouse pressed, mouse released. This is the same as in the draw method, checking if mouse pressed is false. So mouse pressed is true, mouse pressed is false, if we want to check that in the draw method. Uh, we have mouse dragged. which gets called as I move over with the mouse button down, it will constantly get called. But it won't get called if the mouse button isn't down. And lastly, mouse moved. 
which gets called when the mouse button isn't down. So mouse button down and moving is dragged, mouse button not down and moving is moved. So convenience functions, but again, you could do everything in draw if that works better for you. Um, and for example, we could use that mouse dragged function with that line thing we, ha we saw before. And now we've actually made our code to draw even simpler. Before we checked if the mouse button was down and everything, now we know in the, in the mouse drag function the button's going to be down, so we can draw that. Does that make sense? Everyone comfortable with that? It's, yeah, nothing too crazy complicated. I guess the confusing thing about processing is that it supports multiple ways of checking these things, whereas some languages don't. Some languages won't have these events. Uh, likewise, there is, so that's mouse stuff, there is a keyboard, um, keyboard similar things, um, there is key pressed, with a capital P, which will be false, oh, should be false until I press a key, and then it'll be true. If I wanted to find out what key had been pressed, as we saw on Tuesday, there is a key variable, J, H, G, F. Or if we wanted to, we could just use the key pressed method, which will only fire when I'm pressing a key. This one will fire multiple times if I hold down the key because we have key repeat. So if I touch key here, you'll see it like keeps pressing the same key over and over again. That's not a processing thing, that's an operating system thing that they have this key repeat. So I can actually, I don't know where it changes in on a Mac, but in Windows you can change the keyboard repeat settings. There it is. So I can change this to be off so if I press and hold F, it will ignore what I just told it to do. Um, okay, so it sort of ignores what I told it to do. But there we go. So now if I change the keyboard settings. So in draw, again there is a slight difference. In draw, as long as I've got that key down, it'll print the value. Whereas key pressed depends on your system settings. So if I have this set to key repeat off, for some reason Mac always prints out two, three, four, okay. It's printing out multiple ones, but it sh it's dependent on your operating system in that case, in that um, if it's your, you don't have key repeat set on, key pressed won't fire m multiple times. And from memory, there are key released as well, which is when you let go of a key. And again, you can say, oops, released key. Get rid of that one. So if I push a key, nothing happens, but when I let go of it, it says I've released key F, released key J. All right, cool, that is Interaction. So we've started on that. It's 5.2 and we're going to move into external libraries next. So I think we'll leave that until next week. Does anyone have any questions about anything we've covered today? The assignments, the homework, the anything? No? Everyone just looks like they want to get out of here, so that's all good. Let's do that. Um, cool. So again, you know, I highly recommend... Taking, putting aside 30 minutes of your day and just having a play with the stuff. I'll put, I've been, all the, the more interesting examples that I've done in class, I've been saving and uploading them to um, learn as we go. So you are welcome to download them and have a play around with them and see if you can make sense of them. Also, I think Greg has uploaded the first set of lecture slides to YouTube. So I will go and put them on learn as well if you really craving more of my monotonous droning voice, you can go back and watch.